I think what Victor was trying to say is that I keep telling him to calm down. <laughs> um, good morning. Um, I want to touch on uh, a couple of things today. But first, I want to start talking about an operation that uh, our country has been implementing since 1993. It's one I like to call Operation Overkill. And the reason is that Operation Overkill is made up of numerous other operations. Since 1993, on our southern border, we have implemented Operations Blockade, Hold the Line, Gatekeeper, Safeguard, Rear Grand, Triple Strike, Return to Sender, Jump Start, Full Court Press, Stone Garden, Gun Runner, and Armas Cruzadas. How's that worked out for us? <laughs> Did we solve the problem? The problem is that you can't find the right solution unless you know what the problem is. And I don't think we have agreement in this country on what the problem actually is. Now, we can do it a couple of different ways. Um, one issue is law enforcement. And I talk about this issue like an iceberg because typically it's 15% of the iceberg that's, that is above the surface of the water. And that's what we tend to focus on. In that 15%, we have uh, what part of amnesty do you not understand? We have the border fence. We have the rule of law, and we have um, Operation Overkill. And so when you only focus on one part of the problem, we begin to prove the old adage of insanity. You keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But yet we're not learning from our mistakes, and that's one of the things that I want to talk about. I equate what we're doing to when you have a pipe that bursts in your kitchen. Because when you have a pipe that bursts in your kitchen, you have two options. You can send in more people with mops, or you can fix the pipe. When you ask a member of Congress or a presidential candidate um, over the years, and you ask them, how do we fix our broken immigration system? The first thing that they say is, we need more boots on the ground, which is code for we need more border patrol, which is also code for send in more mops. So <coughs> we keep sending and doubling and tripling the size of the border patrol, and the problem gets worse. Illegal immigration, we've had more illegal entries since 1993 after a dozen enforcement operations than before. We've had the cost of, uh, the cost of apprehension has gone up nearly 500%. The death rate from people trying to cross the Arizona desert to get in the United States has skyrocketed. <coughs> the cost for border security has gone up dramatically. Yet the problem continues to get worse. One issue is that when you build a border fence, you're trying to keep people out, but the Border Patrol will tell you it was never their intention to stop illegal entries with the fence. The purpose of the fence, according to the United States Border Patrol, was to slow down the immigrants by three to four minutes to give them enough time to make an apprehension. And we're spending billions of dollars to buy three to four minutes of time. And I'm not sure that the American public is aware of why the fence was built. And so what happens is we get stuck in this law enforcement mentality. Um, when you look at <clears throat> what we focus on when it comes to this issue, we're, fo we're focused on Border Patrol. Meanwhile, Customs has suffered because we've sent all our money over to Border Patrol. The people who are trying to do commerce and international trade with the United States now struggle because the ports of entry are clogged, because the lines are too long. Now, when you go to a grocery store, what happens when the line gets too long? They open another cashier. We don't do that at our ports of entry. And so we're doing this at our own peril to our own economic detriment. Now, um, one aspect of the, the focus on enforcement is to look at the law enforcement community. The DEA has lowered their drug standard in order to meet their quotas for you to become an agent. The FBI has lowered their gang standard in order for you to enter to become an agent so that they can meet their quotas. The United States military is recruiting people who are convicted felons who have committed arson and assault and aggravated assault because they have to meet quotas. And so we can keep looking at this as an enforcement problem or as an immigration problem, or we can look at it from an economic and prosperity standpoint and say, what are we doing wrong and how do we fix it? Because in the business world, when something's not working, you stop doing it. 
and you change, you tweak, you adjust, you move, you start over, you do something that's different because what you're, not do what you're doing is not working. But yet, we're not there and we're not focused on that because our Congress continues to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. So here's what's happening. While we're staring at the tip of the iceberg over here, Rome is burning. And by Rome, I mean our, our economy. Because what's happening is we're sending jobs outside of this country because of our broken immigration system. A couple of years ago, Microsoft built a software engineering plant, not in their home state of Washington, not in their home country, the United States, but they built it in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Why? Well, because we didn't have enough software engineers to be able to fill how many they need. And software engineers are a dime a dozen in Canada. So let's go back and review about our immigration policy. While Congress is focused on the southern border, let's take a look at the, what's happening on the northern border. We're shipping high paying, high tech jobs to another country. Now here's the problem with that. Not only is that bad from the standpoint of the 1,500 people, the 1,500 jobs that we sent out to, to Canada, but all the economists say that Microsoft has a multiplier effect of four, which means for every job that Microsoft creates, there are four others created in the industry to support that job. So you have the software engineer who designs the software product, and the other four jobs could be made up of um, the person who packages the product, and then the person, perhaps the truck driver who ships the product, and the cashier who sells the product, and the customer service person who supports the product. So not only did we send 1,500 jobs out to Canada, but we also sent 6,000 support jobs to Canada. Now that's on the high-tech, high-skill side on the northern border. Let's take a look at the low-skill side. Well, California ag producers are getting frustrated because they're having difficulty finding people to harvest their crops. Now, it's very simple. For centuries, uh, people went to where the jobs were. That's why we've had over the years a massive migration pattern from rural areas to urban areas. But that's reversed now. Jo uh, excuse me, jobs will go to where the talent is. And right now, the high-skilled talent's in Canada and the low-skilled talent is in Mexico. So California ag producers are packing up and moving their operations to Mexico, where there's plenty of labor. Now, there's a couple of uh, issues here to consider. This is the ripple effect. I like to say it's, the like of, it's like the law of physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So now, I want someone to explain to me when it became a good thing to grow our nation's food supply in another country. Meanwhile, in California, the ag producers, the vegetable growers, are selling their land which is being developed. And California is now worried about losing their standing as being the leading agricultural producer in the country. So we're sending high-skilled jobs to Canada, and we're sending low-skilled jobs to Mexico, and we're s we find ourselves today having a national conversation about the creation of jobs. So the creation of jobs doesn't just take a simple act of Congress. It takes some common sense looking at where the jobs are going and why they're leaving the country. That brings me to the point that this is not a black or a white issue. So we can look at it from a variety of perspectives, but as long as we stay focused on the enforcement angle, we lose. We lose as an economy, we lose as a people, and we lose as a country. Enforcement is a critical component of our immigration system. I don't think there's any argument there. But when you become obsessed with it, when you become focused on it, and when you allow our economy to fail at the expense of enforcement, then we all lose. And it's a difficult situation to, uh, to overcome. So with that, I want to take a look at um, another part of the uh, iceberg that's below the surface of the water that people are not paying attention to. And they're not paying attention to my family. Uh, this is my father's family. My father was one of 11 people, uh, one of 11 kids. He's on the far left, the very dapper looking gentleman uh, in the suit at age 14. He's next to his sister, uh, Keta, Flavia, Herbert, Hope, Phil, uh, Cecilia, Odelia, George. The little Shirley Temple is my Aunt Dolores and my Aunt Lydia on the far right. One of 11. My mother, by coincidence, was also one of 11. 
and also seven girls and four boys. Amanda, Marina, Melida, Virginia, my mother, Oralia, um, Alicia, Adela, and then in the front row, the boys, Sigifredo, Jesus, Oscar, and Reynaldo. So my father was one of 11, my mother was one of 11. Well, they got together and they had five kids. Eddie, Patsy, James, Cindy, and Carly. So I'm one of five, my wife is one of five, and we had three kids. So my family's not typical, but if you just use my family as an example, you began to see the inverted pyramid that we've developed in this country. 11, five, three. Now, this issue is very common, very easy to understand whenever we have a national conversation about Social Security. There's fewer people in the workforce supporting the elderly that are trying to retire. But for some reason, it's a very difficult concept to grasp when we talk about immigration because we're still focused on the border fence and we're focused on doubling the size of the border patrol. And so when you look at what's happened from a demographic standpoint, it's not hard to see. Canada, um, our national fertility rate in the United States is at 2.1, which ironically is replacement level. And we're expected to fall below replacement uh, by the year 2015, 2020. Canada has a fertility rate of 1.6. You know what they do while we're building our southern wall to keep uh, Mexican immigrants from entering the country? They fly jumbo jets to Mexico and recruit workers to work in their country because they are so shy of people, they'll do anything to import them to keep their economy prospering. So <clears throat> Mexico has a fertility rate of 2.2. In 1960, the average adult female in Mexico had seven children. Today, they're having 2.2. If you do the math, what we're doing is we're building a fence to keep out the people that are gonna stop coming in a few years. <laughs> because they need them for their own economy. And so if you look at the demographics of what's happening, and that's just in this hemisphere, there will be no more waves of Western Europeans, Brits and Irish and Italians and Russians that came at the turn of the century and just before the turn of the century uh, in the early 1900s and the late 1880s. Their fertility rates are at the same level as Canada or lower. France is having cultural clashes with the large group of Muslims that are moving into France and that's related to the fact that um, it's quite a bit different over there, different languages, different cultures, and far different from what we deal with here. So you have a choice. You can either continue to grow your own population or you can import them. Uh, but you can't complain if you push yourself in that direction and you're not able to recover. In Russia, Russia loses 700,000 people every year. Their population shrinks by 700,000 people. Demographers say that Japan is beyond the tipping point and will lose several million people between now and 2030. Tens of millions, actually. Now, in Russia's case, or in Japan, they pay women $3,500 a year per child per year until that child reaches the age of 14 as an incentive to have more children. In Russia, they tried a different approach. They declared a new federal holiday. It's a national day of procreation. Everyone is given the day off and asked to go home and turn out the lights and close the curtains and do their patriotic duty. <laughs> so we have a choice. We can continue to focus on enforcement or we can look at the changing demographics and how the world has changed around us. I mentioned that jobs will go to, to, to talent and that's because in, in large part to technology. You know, years ago you had to move from rural to urban that's where the jobs were, that's where the quality of life is. Now many people are looking to move out of the urban areas um, and to you know, get back into a, a safe uh, uh, and comfortable environment away from, the, away from the big city. And if you ever wanted to see an example of our aging society, look at the Border Patrol. 51% of all Border Patrol and Customs agents are eligible for retirement next year. So the next time a member of Congress tells you um, we need more boots on the ground, ask them, where do you plan to get them from? <laughs> because for every one you hire, you're losing one out the back door to retirement. 
this national wave of the baby boomers is impacting every aspect of our society. If you look at the aerospace industry, 40% of the aerospace assembly line workers in this country are eligible for retirement next year. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong is in 2007, an F-15 broke up in midair. And the Secretary of the Air Force said, my God, I, I inspected the F-15 fleet, and it's all aging. We have a geriatric fleet. And so are the F-16s and the F-22s and the F-35s and the C-130s and the KC-135s. It all has to be replaced. How do you replace your fleet if you're losing 40% of your workforce to retirement? The answer there is not immigration because these are classified jobs. You have to be born in this country to work there. What is the answer? I don't know, but we better start working on it. But we're too busy focused on the border fence. Now, part of the problem, too, is driven by fear. Fear, anxiety, and cultural vulnerability. People worry that our lives are going to change. Well, um, Benjamin Franklin worried about that because he was not a fan of the Germans moving into Pennsylvania. He said, this is an English colony. What are you people doing here? Um, they said the same thing about the Irish and the Italians and the Russians. You know, we are a melting pot. We all know that. But fear is causing cities like Riverside, New Jersey, and Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and Manassas, Virginia, and Farmers Branch, Texas, and the state of Arizona, and now the states of Alabama and Georgia, to drive people away. You may have read or seen or heard that several hundred students after the Alabama state uh, immigration law passed, several hundred students have disappeared out of the school system. Well, again, let's go back to the law of physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So what happens when those students disappear? Well, th the school districts make the, get their federal funding on average daily attendance. So it's about $4,500 per student per year. You multiply that times just 100 kids, and you're at close to half a million dollars. And so when a school district begins to lose a half a million dollars, that means some teachers may lose their jobs and some librarians and some lunch ladies and some bus drivers. And so the ripple effect continues to go through our economy. Now, um, again, I started off talking about the concept and how to look at this issue as an iceberg because we're focused on the tip that we can see. But what's the part of the iceberg that sinks ships? It's the bottom part, it's the 85% that's a much bigger chunk that we cannot see. It not only sinks ships, but in our case, it's going to sink our economy if we don't start looking at it and focusing on it. In that bottom part of the iceberg, you have the aging of our society. You have the retiring baby boomers. 10 to 15 million baby boomers, 10 to 15 million more people are leaving the workforce than entering the workforce. And, and if we can't grow them, we need to import them. Iceland and India have the same visa allotment. Now, mo uh, many of our engineers and our doctors and our PhDs in science, technology, engineering, math are not coming from Iceland. They're coming from India. But if you're from Iceland, you have to wait a year to get your visa. If you're from India, you have to wait 10 years. Why are we punishing our own economy based on where someone is born? So we have a choice. We can stop focusing on enforcement and we can start looking at what we need to do because <laughs> if, if we don't and if we pass the tipping point, we will only have one thing to look forward to and that's a new federal holiday. Thank you very much.